When's the last time you had a James Dean moment? I mean, really rebel. I say that because so often, rebellion is a catalyst for innovation. Because of Craig Venter's rebellious spirit, the human genome was sequenced faster than anyone could have ever imagined. So innovation just doesn't fall from the sky, right? Something, something has to really drive it, OK? So I come from the world of the life sciences, OK? I've, my life is spent in labs. I'm a lab rat. I've been doing that for most of my life. Um, and I love it passionately, OK? Now, innovation, though, is a lot of us are starting to feel that innovation is kind of in short supply. Um, and as evidence of this, the drug rate of drug discovery in the United States has been falling pretty steadily um, over time. So the fact that this, we're at the point where for every billion dollars that we spend on R&D in the drug discovery realm, um, we, don't even, we don't even get one drug out of that. Okay? Now, you know, where do companies get their drug targets from? Where do they, where do they know where to look? Well, they, they rely on academic research, okay? And, and right now, we're also seeing a lot of other symptoms of perhaps we're not innovating. A lot of studies cannot be reproduced. And the level of retractions and mistakes in published articles is skyrocketing over the last 10 years. OK, so what, what is going on? OK, so you know, there's this thing called Moore's Law, all right? And that describes the exponential rate of of in, in technology, specifically in computers, computing power has doubled every two years since 1970 to 2010. Okay, so since we're at the British consulate, I find it interesting that Nature, a British um, journal, has decided to call this Irum's Law, which is the reverse of Moore's. I think that's pretty playful, but I think that when um, when a, when a journal decides to kind of poke fun at <laughs> how bad drug discovery is going on in the US, that, that kind of says something to us. Okay? So, so where should we look for innovation in the life sciences? I mean, if, if you believe that we need it, and I, I, I truly believe that we do. Well, let's look to Silicon Valley, right? I mean, uh, when you think about Silicon Valley, when you think about computing, when you think about information technology, we kind of expect it to just exponentially increase all the time, right? We want our iPhones and iPads to be better next year or else, you know, we'll be really upset. So, um, so, you know, there's this idea that, okay, if we look towards where innovation arose in Silicon Valley, where was it? Well, it was often a garage, okay? It was often a garage. So, um, so if the next, you know, if Google arose in a garage, you know, could the next biotech big biotech company, you know, arise in a place like this. So, you know, this is actually a garage in Silicon Valley um, where people are trying to do this. So you're like, well, you, you can't put a lab in your garage. That's really strange, you know. Research belongs in, you know, big institutions and companies. You, you can't do sophisticated research in your backyard, and maybe you shouldn't, right? <laughs> maybe we don't want people to do this, right? Um, so there is a movement um, that I was recently where, made aware of, um, and they're made up of people like this. Now, they call themselves biohackers, okay? And so they're, 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 they're all ages, but they're all very energetic, and they all feel as though we should challenge the norms of how research is done. We should, we should make research accessible to a broader community and kind of unleash creativity and innovation in the way that it was done for computers, OK? Um, and one of the things, for example, you know, you can set up a lab. Here's an example um, of a hypothetical lab you could set up in your garage <laughs> uh, that appeared in Nature. And there's a lot 
of ways that you can be very resourceful and be able to do things that you can do in, in labs that I've worked in most of my life. You know, you, if, one of the most silly things is maybe you could, you know, use the under, the, oh, your, your body temperature to incubate E. coli. So I found that pretty amusing, okay? <laughs> so I, I haven't resorted to that, not yet, okay? So, um, so you know, I, recognizing this movement that's going on, um, you know, here I am, and I've started a company, and, um, but how did, it wasn't always a straight path to get here. You know, I, to be, I guess, an entrepreneur is something you're not really told to do ever, you know? We don't bring up our kids to become entrepreneurs. Maybe some people do, but you're usually told to go in a specific field, okay? So, you know, my story really began um, with the Fulbright, my experience in Russia, um, and I went there in 2003, 2004, and I, I worked in laboratories there. And so before I even heard of the term biohacker, I was like, well, I kind of saw it already. It was in Russia, you know? I mean, science in Russia, they have limited resources. Um, this is a, I even, I even knew a friend who um, nourished his cells using, I guess, serum from his own blood, which is something I wouldn't recommend doing at home. But, you know, I, <laughs> But, you know, but scientists there, they, they realize that you're not really, resources aren't really the limiting factor. It's oftentimes it's, it's imagination and creativity, and sometimes we forget that here, you know. And so this tenant arose from my time in Russia that I've stuck to, which is always, always, always be resourceful, okay? And, and there are always more ways to be resourceful. If you haven't thought of them, then you need to keep thinking harder, okay? So I returned from Russia, and I think the Fulbright kind of, that experience kind of raised the bar in terms of my expectations and also kind of what I had to do had to be, it better be fun, right? It had to be fun, and I had to believe in it, and I had to be passionate about it, okay? So what, what happened was, when I came back, I was working on my first PhD, and I just, I just didn't feel that it was working out. I didn't feel passionate about it. I didn't really believe in the science I was doing. So I made the decision to quit. So I, I quit my first PhD, and I already told me that was the wrong thing to do. At least you should finish it. But thanks to the Fulbright, I had the courage to, to quit, OK? <laughs> and I don't like to call it quitting. I like to call it you know, walking away from something you're not passionate about, because I think it can lead to better things, OK? So, so you know, I, but, but, but months later, within a year, I was back in the lab working on my second attempt at a PhD. Okay, so that brought me over to Boston. So you know, I, I couldn't leave science. I tried, I, and I came right back. Okay, so you know, this time I was determined. Like I'm actually going to finish this this PhD, and um, I, I ran into a whole different sort of challenge. Uh, these had to do with inventing and intellectual property. Okay, and so I've you know I like to play around in the lab. I like to make things, develop things. Um, that usually angered my former professors because they'd rather have me getting results than trying to reinvent methods that are already established. Okay. But I did happen to develop some things that the university was interested in patenting because they felt it would be commercializable. So I was really excited about that at first. I was like, yes, my, I can put on a business card the word inventor. I'm officially an inventor. I can tell all my friends I'm one. My parents will probably be proud of me finally. And, uh, <laughs> Um, so there was this initial excitement, but it, it, it quickly dissipated because when I realized that I actually had no ownership, either legally or intellectually, in anything that I would come up with in the university setting. Okay, so there's good and bad reasons for that. You know, there's there's a lot because of granting universities the rights to intellectual property of anybody within the university. A lot has been transferred over, or that was the intention to be able to motivate transferring technology for the public good, okay? But what that kind of does, you know, it, it's, it, it kind of, I think that can stifle innovation because that, what that does is it discourages people like me in the labs from actually innovating because I think when you go into science, like, it's, it's, you're doing it because you believe in it, but it's also, you know, th that something is yours and that you created it is very important, okay? So um, I... I, I accepted it, and um, my, you know, I had decided. Well, you know, I I think that 
this is something I want to continue after I graduate. So this is something I can maybe even start a business on. Maybe what I'll even do is license my invention back to me from the university. So, so you know, I, I, so I worked with the system. Um, but in the end, I realized that it would just, it was, the costs were prohibitive like to, to license um, inventions, technologies from universities. There's a big barrier. And if you're a small startup, it might be better to use those costs to actually develop your product before you spend it all away on licensing it. And it kind of felt weird because I was just kind of licensing my own, what I thought was my own ideas back from the university. So you know, the third tenet that kind of was galvanized by this whole experience was you know, respect the rights of the creator. By this, I mean the inventor. Um, and I think that innovation, we have to think about that. We have to think about what motivates people to innovate. Okay, And so in the university setting, people who are innovating are grad students, postdocs, researchers, people at the lab bench. You know, um, professors, they inspire innovation. You know, I wouldn't be here where I am today without the mentorship of professors, but things have changed. Professors aren't in the lab all day, so they're not physically there to kind of put things together in a way that you only can by working in that environment every day. So, but we're not providing enough motivation for that. And so I think that's one explanation for why maybe there's kind of this, to me, it just seems this, this, this decline in innovation in, in these settings that you used to see a lot more of. Okay? So you know, I, I left the university. I did actually finish my degree. Um, and I left with those three tenants. And I, and I said, like, well, you know, let's, let's start this. Let's, let's start this fresh. Let's, let's go at this alone. I have a lot of ideas. I'm going to develop my own intellectual property. OK? Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to start a company from scratch. I'm going to get people together. I'm going to get resources. I'm going to do it. Um, and so I had a lot of good advice along the way. But where do you start? Starting a, a life sciences-based company is a little bit more complicated than a tech, you know, information technology-based company or, or, or a software or a computer-based company, because usually you, you know, Google started in a garage, but they really just needed an internet connection, maybe, and a computer. So, so setting up a lab can be a little bit more complex. So, um, so you know, me and my business partners, none of us actually even had a garage. So, you know, we were like, what are we going to do? Um, so, well, we didn't, you know, we didn't really want a garage because. You know, it, there, you can't ship certain chemicals to a garage, and you might be flagged by the FBI or something like that if you do that. So, maybe not the best place to start a biotech company, or at least not yet. All right. So, but what we didn't realize is how affordable it actually is to be able to find laboratory space, um, especially in Massachusetts. So, we we found a space that costs about the same as a, a rent for an apartment, and and we got started right away. And so, um, I was able to. The, the model that we wanted to embrace was, was that of bootstrapping. Okay, so bootstrapping, it sounds like such a great kind of rebellious term, right? I loved it. And what bootstrapping is, is basically you start, you make something that is valuable for others, that you, 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 in, you generate cash flow right away, and you take your product and you iterate it as many times as fast as you can early on before you even raise hardly any money. And so I, that's a model a lot of software companies actually follow. Um, right? How many versions, how many beta versions or different versions have you come across of different software? So you, know, you, you, you start to realize that there are not, not really any rules or there's nobody really to provide this advice in the world of life sciences because this doesn't really exist yet. I mean, people don't really do this yet. Um, but they're starting to. They're starting to. And, and what I want to communicate is that it's actually very possible because we have gotten off the ground. We have bootstrapped our way into at least being able to sustain our existence. And I think that you know, within it's been less than a year since I graduated. So this journey has been really kind of a whirlwind. But but and and it has also a great deal of uncertainty. So so right. So can can we? Can biotech emerge in places outside of the establishment, outside of big companies? And you know, my answer to you is yes, because I think we've lived through that so far. So, you know, 
will the stage be set for a bioscience version of Apple or Google to be born in a dorm room or garage? You know, it sounds kind of silly, um, but what, well, what is the take home message um, that, that I want you guys to go home with today? And it is that, that science is at a crossroads right now, okay? Um, a week ago, I, I went to see my friends. Uh, he defended his thesis. And you, you always want to go back and find out what happened to all your former colleagues, okay? So I'm like, you know, did so-and-so graduate? Did so-and-so get a job? And this is just, just a common story that, you know, one friend I knew, she, she's been, she left research and to start a, you know, she's great at, great at um, putting clothes together. She started her own fashion line, so she did that. Another colleague left to start her MBA, you know. Um, another couple are going to be employed after, you know, a year-long search for a professorship. So, I mean, that's the reality, and this is nothing new. We've been talking about this for the last 20 years, okay, about, about how, yes, it's, it's important that we encourage students to go into science and technology. Um, when we train these people like me, we train them to be students, we, we cultivate them to be professors, and there's, 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 there's no opportunities there. And so um, this is a real problem that I don't know that there's a real quick and easy solution to, but I kind of see this as maybe we need some kind of external pressure to be put. And maybe these minds, these, these minds of very talented people leaving science I mean, I just see it every day. It's, it's not this idea floating around. It's very tangible. I almost left science. But I insisted on staying because I just loved it so much. And so, you know, I, what I want to really say to people out there who are scientists like me, who are kind of maybe, you know, we, we really love science, but th there's, there's not really a clear path forward, you know. And so, you know, I, I really want to, call out to them to tell them that there are other ways to change science, that you can still do science, um, and there's a lot of possibilities. So, so why don't we together break down these institutional walls, and why don't we continue to innovate? So thank you. <laughs>